Welcome to Poetic Lines, where writers make the language sing. Today my guest is David Surrett, a high school English teacher, varsity hockey coach, and an animal lover who has owned dozens of farm animals in the past 20 years, much to his surprise. I say that because David grew up in the Boston suburb of Malden, where very few of his friends or family members had pets. He didn't own his first dog, a border collie, until he got married. Yet when he and his wife moved to a five-acre place in southeastern Massachusetts a few years later, they purchased a second border collie and adopted a horse that had been retired off the racetrack. Over time, the couple and their three children owned multiple border collies and Australian shepherds, numerous sheep, goats, and 15 horses. David's newest book, Stable, shares some of those stories and the lessons he has learned from the animals, each of whom had a distinct personality and preferences. Some also had difficulty trusting humans because of how they'd been treated by previous owners. David had to deal with all of that as he navigated relationships with his companions day by day and learned that a firm yet soft grip was usually the best approach. When Stable was published earlier this year, David was surprised by the way readers responded to the work and the subject matter, sharing their own animal stories and traumatic moments. The collection has also gained critical acclaim and was recently named an honors book in the 2016 Massachusetts Book Award program. David, who has published four other books of poems, says the award was an unexpected delight and a welcome validation of his lifelong devotion to writing. His poems have appeared in many journals, such as Peregrine, Off the Coast, and Salamander, and in anthologies. He has been a co-host of Poet Tribe, an instructor at the Cape Cod Writers' Conference, a keynote speaker at the Breadloaf Writing Conference, and he is featured at poetry venues across New England. I'm happy to have David here to talk about his work, animals, and what it means to build and maintain a stable. David, welcome. Thank you. And congratulations. Thank you. It's nice to be here. So you're going to open with one of the poems in the book. Yes. <clears throat> it's actually the first poem. And it's a Malden poem. Aquariums. I tag along with my brother Steve to all the aquarium stores in the area. There was one on Highland Ave and briefly one at the corner of Charles and Gale one block from our house. I even followed him down Pleasant into Medford. These places were hot and damp, tropical. I was afraid to breathe, believing my lungs would grow green. He loved turtles and kept them in a plastic bowl, the one with the green palm tree. They didn't last long, and sometimes their eyes swelled shut or their shells grew weak. Steve learned what to do to save them, fed them what they needed, even bought drops when their eyes swelled. He had fish, too, guppies and gouramis and African frogs. This didn't fit with the hockey Steve, the fierce, quick-tempered defenseman, or the Steve I saw in the empty lots by school, fighting all comers, throwing lefts when they expected rights. Every time I read or hear that poem, two things come to mind. The first is the incredible tenderness of your brother taking such good care of those turtles and making sure that they have what they need to survive. And the second is the fact that you were watching and noticing that tenderness and noticing the way he interacted with the animals, noticed his compassion. You really were a poet at a, that young age, even if you weren't writing yet. What stands out to you about that poem? Well, you're going to hear this word a lot, is that I'm surprised that you say that, and I'm surprised um, that's what that was. Um, and, I, and I guess that, I mean, that's why, that's why I love my brother. That's why I, 
I always wanted to be with my brother because I knew that uh, he was a really good, good guy, and, but he certainly was a tough guy, that he was both things. So, and maybe he wouldn't, he wouldn't admit to the, the soft things. Um, and I think maybe I would have, <laughs> and I wasn't as tough as him. So, you know, maybe that's how it balanced out. So you got your first dog, a Border Collie, after you were married. Yes. And then you and your wife moved to a, an area with five acres. Yes. And you ended up getting a second Border Collie, and you adopted a horse. Yes, it, it kind of went like this. We, well, we had, the, we had a rescue Border Collie that we just, you know, that was my city dog. And then um, we got a, a Border Collie from a farm. A, that was uh, it was a herding dog. It was a beautiful dog, and I didn't. I wasn't sure why we moved to Southeastern out of Malden, but I found out soon enough because when my wife said that her aunt was sending down a racehorse from Maine and she needed a stable and a paddock, and out in my backyard was were trees, and I had never built. I, I hadn't built anything since I helped my father build an addition, you know, like 20 years before that. And yeah, and I, I found a sawmill down the street and the band at the sawmill drew up plans how to build a stable and, and I built me a stable and took down a 200 trees, I bet. And the racehorse was, uh, she was Stephanie, she was three years old and she was a standard bred, she was a trotter. So like a lot of things in life, uh, if I knew what I know now, I wouldn't have done any of this. We just we just put a saddle on her and jumped on her. She had never had a saddle on her. She was a she was a she pulled the sulky. She was a standard bred trotter. Uh. <laughs> we just threw the saddle on and jumped on her and fell off. We fell off, but yeah, we we just we just did it. So you used that word surprise again when you were telling that story. How did you? stay open to the idea of suddenly you're going to have this horse and oh yes you've got to build a stable something you've never done before um it's it, it's trust it's trust especially in my wife i'm uh i'm like i'm the content person i i never think of what i don't have and she always is thinking of something new and, but every time she comes up with something including moving there children horses all of that it worked out great so I just trust. And it did work out great. It changed, it, you know, the animals changed my life. But I never, I never would have got a dog. I never, I never would have done anything. But once I'm in, I'm all in. When you describe the two of you and the fact that she is always looking for new ideas and you're content, in a way that almost sounds like various elements in a poem. Because when you're writing, you are always striving to catch something new, yet you also have to trust the process. Yes, <clears throat> I think. Yeah, I think that's. Yeah, I think that's. I think that's the way I think anyway. So, I, so I, I think I, I write the way I live and see the world. So yes, yes, that it's it's the combination of the two things, and the third thing is the unexpected thing. All the things that owning horses gave me. I, I, uh, I knew nothing about them, and I knew that if I was going to put my children on them, I have to learn everything about them. And and then I learned what the most, the best thing I learned about them is that I was good with them. You know, that was the best thing is that I was really good with them. That um, I could make them do what I want, and I could make them, uh, and they and they liked me. <laughs> they liked to be with me, uh, and I had. Uh, if you if you said five years before, would you think you'd be good horses? I'd say, I don't know. Why would I even be involved with horses? What was your approach when you were dealing with the horses? <clears throat> well, um, well, at first it was all wrong, of course. You know, that's when we fell off, and and um, so I went and what I usually do, I find somebody who knows more than I do. My wife had had a horse when she was younger, so first I learned from her. And then, you know, some local people. Uh, we found people who knew more than me and some trainers. And then, um, the, you know, the books, the videos. And then I would, 
I found a couple of trainers. One was John Lyons, and the other was Monty Roberts, who did, uh, um, they do round pen training, which, it's, which there's no force, there's no violence. It's, it's, it's using the horse's natural instincts to make the horse, it's called join up with you, to agree to, to be with you. So I went to see both of them a whole bunch of times, and I bought me a round pen, and <laughs> I figured out how to do it. And it, was, and it was wonderful. And the moment, you know, I don't want to overstate it, but you know, when you send the, the whole idea is to send the horse away. And horses, um, they're, they're either fight or flight, so you send them away, but since it's a round pen, eventually they, they come to a point where I can't run anymore. I've run as far as I can. I, I've outrun everything in the world and I'm still going around. So it, it starts to look at you in the center and at first it gives you its ear, and then it gives you its eye, and then it starts to lower its head, and then it starts to, to chew, uh, which is saying that I'm a vegetarian, I'm not going to bite you. And then it stops and turns and faces you and walks to you. It's like, I can't even describe that moment. It's like, and it comes to you and it puts the head right here, you know, a thousand pound animal puts the head right here and says, okay. What's the deal? I, I did my best trick. I ran away from you, and I didn't get away. If and that's you, the start. If you haven't written that down, you need to, because <laughs> no, it is there gorgeous. Is the, yeah, there is. Well, I tried to. And it's not, and I didn't invent it. I mean, I, I just learned it. But um, that moment is just, if, uh, if I miss anything, that's what I miss. But it's really hard work, and it's scary. Um, you know, I've had a horse, I've had been kicked here, I've had one, one right by my head, mm -hmm. I've been kicked from the front, that you know, have to work through a lot of, they have to do a lot of things in order to, um, to give up. <laughs> so you sort of have to, you know, there is always a risk. So I don't miss the physical, the frightening part of it, but, or the exhaustion of chasing the horse, and, but that moment, you know, I do miss that moment a lot. Are there similar moments when you're teaching or when you're coaching hockey? Oh, absolutely. No, absolutely. It's funny, I said to the students today, uh, to my students today, I, I just said this. I said, you just, I said, thank God I trained horses because you do exactly what a horse does. Whenever you learn something new, you forget the last thing I taught you. <laughs> and I have to go back and reteach that. And it's always a step forward and a step back and a step forward and a step back. But also letting them, you know, um, not criticizing them, not pressuring them, letting them have that moment when they look up and they go, oh, okay. So yes, absolutely. So it's, I've, especially adolescents, they're very horse-like. I mean, they're, they're like horses, they'd rather be with them, each other, and then they'd rather eat, and then the third thing is maybe me. So just like a horse. So yeah, oh, absolutely. It made me patient with my own children too. You know, that when the moment, usually right before a horse does something, if you're training it just to turn its head, um, right before it's about to learn it, it fights you the most. That's when it's absolutely the most stubborn. And you wait, and you wait, and you wait, and you wait, and then it goes, oh, you want me to do this? Yes, that's all I wanted. And it's, it was worth it. But if you didn't wait, if you had a chain on its nose, or you, you know, were slapping it, I don't, you don't get that moment, I don't think. Mm. And I've seen, you know, we went to enough, enough horse, shoes, horse shows that I, I saw some horses that were treated very well. Mm. Uh, and what's the fun of that? Mm. <laughs> you have also had multiple dogs. Yeah, lots of dogs. Yes, and I know border collies are extremely smart. Well, yeah, the great thing, yeah, because the... the you're supposed to resemble your dog, so for a while I had two border collies, which are very good looking and very smart. So I felt really cool having border collies, um, and but now I have chihuahuas, so I'm not sure what that uh, it ch it's changed who I am. But um, go ahead, I had to get that joke in. It's it's the joke. What were some of the lessons you learned from the dogs? For, uh, um, well, yeah, the, the big difference, at least I think, between the, the dogs, most dogs, if once you have them, you have them, they love you. 
and they know what the deal is. With horses, you're always negotiating. So I think that, un that, that unqualified love is really great. Um, with Border Collies, it's a little different because they're bred to work. So um, they, they sort of have a no-nonsense sort of thing. Uh, and I remember the, the younger Border Collie, you could never lie down near it. You could never be lower than him because he knew he was the submissive dog. So if I laid down, he'd run out of the room. But it also, you know, um, when it was time to feed the horses, he would come up. When it was time to feed the kids, he, he, he was very regimented and he was very serious. So I, yeah, first that I think the dogs just love you, but I think that you have to figure out, you know, what they need. Every dog is really different. You also built a stable, yeah. which I can imagine is not the easiest task. And if I remember correctly from one of the poems, the first stall you built wasn't exactly plum and square. No, it's great. Because yeah, the, so the, the first one's sort of like this, and then that was a 12 by 12. And then I had to add another stall, and it got a little better. And then the third one's beautiful. It's perfect. <laughs> so I, I was just, I had a hammer, nails, boards, and a level, and I was just, I did it pretty much by myself. And a piece of paper with everything drawn from Ben. So yeah, I got better at it. And it's sort of, it's the way I do everything, is I sort of have to do it wrong first. And I think, and writing's the same way. I'm not afraid to write something really stupid. Sometimes I have to go through that to get something good. So yeah, they got the stuff. But it's still standing. Uh, I drove by it the other day. It's, we've, we've moved, but it's, they're using it to put like, like lawn mowers in. It's still standing uh, t 20 years later. It's still up. How did it feel to drive by that place that you had put so much work into? Um, I love where I am, so that's not a, it's not a problem. I, I don't worry about it, and it's, it seems really well loved, so it, and it's a young couple that bought it, so it's sort of like their turn. But they did take the hill down. Behind, it, they were, behind the stable, there was a hill where the horses would go up when it was raining. And um, this is a terrible story, but I, most people, you wonder what happens when you have a sick horse. When, you have, when a horse dies, you bury it where it falls. So every, every field of horses is really a graveyard. Well, our graveyard was the hill, and they took the hill down. I don't know what they found. They had to find horses. Isn't that awful? It's a <laughs> that made me, that felt really strange, because the horses are up. <coughs> they, it was a big hill, and it's completely flat. So I don't, I'm not asking them, but it had to be a surprise. There were three up there. It sounds like you have several more animal poems yet to write. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I, 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 I never think ahead. We've talked about that. Like, I don't think, and I hope there's more poems coming. I never think ahead. It, um, so yeah, maybe. I don't know what's coming. What made you decide to put together a book of only animal poems? Um, it was sort of what I said about the two things I like about writing. One is, the, is getting the poem, the other is getting readers, is that people would say, I really like your animal poems. Or, I really like your Malden poems. Or, I really like your hockey poems. And I thought, um, it maybe it was mostly women who said they really liked my animal poems. So I thought if I could write a book um, full of poems that women like. <laughs> that would be good. That would be a good thing. Uh, and actually, uh, um, a particular writer, I, I wasn't even thinking of saying this, but uh, a writer I love, 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 and she was my workshop leader in Breadloaf is uh, Bridget. Piggy and Kelly, who I love, and as a person, it was so good to me and so nice to me, and she always wrote to me. And she's the one who loved my animal poems. Mm. And the last time I heard from her was this book, and I don't know, she passed, she died yes. last week. It's heartbreaking. So in a kind of a way, Bridget's the reason I did it, because she mm. was such a great poet, and she was so smart. She's in a whole different league. For her to say, these are the ones I like, I, I kind of wanted to send her a book and say, look, I did it. And, and, uh, and she said what I, I hope she would say. Um, so I now that, yeah. Again, I wouldn't have put those two things together till this second, but yes. So it was awful 
it was awful news. Did she know that you had been chosen for the honor? I don't know. It was really close. It was really close. I hadn't. Uh, I was going to send her something um, to tell her about it, but yeah, it. it I, I don't know. But she. Re but when I sent the book to her, I said I did tell her that she was one of the reasons I put them together. And it's, and she's. I mean, she. I, I don't want to overstate her. I, she, we. She lived far away, and we. We, you know, whenever I put a book out, I would send it, and she would write me a really nice note, but it meant a lot. So, so I guess the two things coming together make it sadder. You could also say that she was a presence in your life. Oh, absolutely. Just like all of the horses and the dogs, yes. they were a different kind of presence that also left a lot of compassion memories, probably laughter, and made you a better poet. Um, absolutely. When people hear you read from this book, you were telling me that a lot of women often will come up and say how much they liked the poems, share their own animal stories, and maybe even share some traumatic memories. And when we were talking, we sort of stumbled upon the idea that for many people, there was always a question of how do you deal with a memory where you were not in power? And along with that, how do you treat another creature that does not have as much power as you do? I'm not sure there's a question in there, but. <laughs> Let me rephrase that. <laughs> no, but yes, I think, that, I think you hit on it in, in that um, at least the, the, the voice of the poet, I, I, you know, my students, we always do this. I do this with them all the time is that when we're talking about the poem, I always say to them, when you get to college, they're going to yell at you for saying the poet is the, is the person in the poem. But the poet's in the person in the poem. I've met all the poets. They're lying to you. They're the person in the poem, 99.9%. .9 so I'm the person in the poem. But I, I think the moments I remember are moments where I, um, I walked up or were up against a moment where um, um, I could have done, or I did do something wrong or harsh, um, and, I, and, and I didn't. <laughs> mm -hmm. and I think the animals uh, are a great way of, because uh, it's true, that the, the things I remember most about the animals are, you know, are those moments when they made me be a better person. And I think every good relationship in my life, whether they're my best friends or my wife or other poets is that is that you know that they 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 either recognize in me or or they bring out something the better part of me because mm -hmm. you know in some ways I'm just a guy from <laughs> Alden. <laughs> but one of the things that I like about these poems is that you are at that point in so many of them where you have to choose: Am I going to have a firm yet soft grip? Or am I going to do something stronger? And that may be why so many people are reacting so strongly to these poems, because there have been moments in their own lives right. where they had to make the same choices. Or worse, I think sometimes worse, that they were, they're the ones that were hit. Mm -hmm. they were, I think that's what I would when, um, when someone wants to share something, usually it isn't. It's some, they, it's that somebody hit, hurt them, mm -hmm. and I think I think sometimes um, someone might think they deserved it, or that's the best they were going to get, or or it's okay, or it it wasn't okay. But either way, it was a terrifying moment, and maybe just to hear that um, that's not always the moment. Um, with a man, because mm -hmm. I, yeah, I can't run away from that, that yeah, I am a guy, is that, you know, that, um, that in the poems at least, I'm not a perfect person, but in the poems at least, the guy in the poem figures it out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, you know, that you have to be strong, especially with a horse, but even with a dog, or they can hurt, they can kill, they can, they can do terrible things <laughs> because um, they're very powerful things. So it's not being weak, it's, it's, um, it's, I don't know, it's that moment in between.
that when, almost when they expect you to be at your worst and when you're not, the animals are like, oh, okay, this is the moment I usually get hit. So imagine if that's a relationship memory. This mm -hmm. is the moment. And here, at least in these poems, this guy didn't hit. Would you read another poem for us? Yes. This is the other end of the, the book. This is the, uh, the poem I always end the reading with. And it's exactly the poem we've sort of been talking about. And um, it's the poem where it's a sort of, uh, it's a complaint against. It. Instead of most of my poems where women are better than me, this is the, the opposite. This is when, uh, uh, when women aggravate me. So it's called The Holder. Uh, the neighbor calls because it's time to share the alpacas, and we own one and a half from her herd. She likes me to hold them. It's a new sharer this year, a different woman, but it's the same. She wants me to be firmer and threatens the animals with worse if they can't behave. She suddenly mocks how I talk to alpacas. The horse trainer we hired for my daughter's horse did the same, but I'm good at this. It's all tension and release. Firm, then give, then reward in my hands and in my voice. With the kicker of the herd, I hold the leg up, firm but soft. She is sheared before she can land a blow. I don't know why these women want a different kind of man. Most days I find it funny, but today it aggravates me. Even the thank yous from the sharer and my neighbor doesn't help. I'm old and tired of having to prove to them that the open hand is as strong as the fist. Thank you for sharing that insight and your wonderful words. Thank you for listening, for asking.